Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship at First Pres Kissimmee. We're glad that you guys could come and participate with us, that you can have some joy and hopefully some laughter as we uh, as we come together. Is the mic okay? Give me a second, guys. Our sound system is having some gremlins in it today. One, two, three, four. Can you guys hear that a little better? Okay, great. So uh, one of our announcements is that our sound system is dying. Uh, this, this morning it was humming and doing some special stuff. So I did the old turn it off and turn it on again, and that worked. Until apparently just now when it wasn't working at all. So uh, please bear with us. I have a, if you want to take a tour through my office after church, you'll see there's a giant soundboard sitting there. Just a matter of getting all the pieces that we need to get it to get it installed. And hopefully our sound will... Uh, become a little better in the future, in the future weeks. Um, a couple of additional announcements. Next Sunday is our Confirmation Sunday. So we've been leading a confirmation class for the last several months, and we have about eight, eight youth that are going to be joining the church next week, which is pretty fantastic. Um, yeah, you can clap for that. Okay. Yeah. So that's going to be next Sunday. It should be really special. If you get a chance to come out, please come out. And then we're going to have um, a small reception after the church. Not a full luncheon, but some cake and, and juice and whatnot just to celebrate what's happening here and, and to enjoy that. So you're welcome to join us after your church for that next week. Also, February 23rd, right now is the day that we are planning to uh, honor Frank Allen. He was going to come to church on February 23rd, and we were going to give him the title of Pastor Emeritus. And he also volunteered to preach that Sunday, so you guys will get to hear him preach, which you guys haven't heard, I guess, in over a year and a half at this point. Um, so he was planning on coming back. Now, depending what the COVID numbers look like, we may have to reschedule that because, um, because of his health and everything that he deals with. We'll, we want to make sure he's in a good environment when he comes here. So we'll play that by ear, but that's the current plan. Um, and... Sound system COVID. Uh, so COVID numbers are going up again, as you all know. Um, the CDC has kind of relaxed some things because it's kind of hard to stop this particular version of the virus. And if you see, we're getting record numbers in Florida Friday. The number of new cases was at over 75,000, which shattered old previous daily records. Um, there's only so much we can do. It's kind of crazy. What I will ask you guys to do is to pray for the church to make right decisions going forward. But I will also ask you is to pray for our health care workers. Um, they, don't, they don't get days off. So as the numbers increase, we also have more people in the hospitals. We're already getting reports again where it's like, hey, don't go to the emergency room unless it's really, really an emergency because they're starting to fill up. So it's, it's been 21 months for them nonstop pretty much. So pray for our health care workers. Pray for us to make good decisions. And that those people that need to go into surgery and get different procedures done, that they can get those things done and, and get the, the help that, that they need. So just pray. I, I don't have an answer. Um, but just, just pray. Let's, let's try to be the best people we can be. Any other announcements that need to be made at this time? All right. Then Mark's going to play a prelude for us. There's a prayer in the bulletin. I'll ask for you to pray that prayer or pray your own prayer. But what I want you to do is give yourself some time to worship God. Take away the distractions. Forget about the little things that pull you away from him. And let's slow down. Let's take away that tempo of life and just listen. Let's sit and hear what he has to say to us.
people praise the Lord. We joyfully proclaim that Christ is here. The God of all creation animates our bodies with the breath of the Spirit. The Lord, the giver of life, has come to dwell among us. I hope we never forget how lucky we are, that God is among us, that God is with us, that God is here in this building as we worship. So I greet you now in the name of him who is, who was, and who will come, the God of all ages. In the name of the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us, in the name of Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead, the King of all kings, and our Lord and Savior. We are God's children. He is ours. And we are his. So let us sing our first hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, hymn 341 in your hymnal. Please stand as we sing. <laughs> As we start a new year, people set New Year's resolutions. And it's funny to me, I realized one year that New Year's resolutions sound a lot like our prayer of confession sometimes. It's, you know, I'm going to eat better, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to do better, I'm going to be a better person, and you set all these things. And then when you look at how many people keep their New Year's resolution, I had the statistics at one point, it's an infinitesimal number of people that actually carry it through for the 12 months. And I think sometimes as we go through our confessions and confess our sins and talk about being better, we sometimes don't always carry it through. We fall and we stumble because we're imperfect. But that's okay. God doesn't call us to be perfect. God calls us to come before him and to confess our sins. So hear the good news. As you confess your sins, as you come before God, know that you are forgiven. 
And God's people said, Amen. Now for our time with children, come on up. We got Mardi Gras beads up here. It's not even Lent yet. All right. So you guys, Caleb, don't pull on that, please. Don't pull on that. So what I have here for you guys today is something called the Rhyme Bible. It's uh, one of my favorite kids' Bible parents. If you need a recommendation for kids' Bible, this is a good one. And I want to read you guys a story out of it today. And after I read the story, I want you guys to tell me what went wrong in the story? Who made a mistake? So, like, somebody's going to make a mistake during the story. I want you guys to tell me what the mistake is, okay? So here's a story. A young boy came to his father one day and said to his dad, I'm going away. Give me the money that's rightfully mine. I know how to spend it. I'm sure I'll do fine. The son took the money and went on his way. He was full of ideas for fun and for play. Oh, the things he would do and the people he'd meet. A life with no worries just couldn't be beat. All of these thoughts so filled up his mind that he hardly remembered the dad left behind. At first he did well, for he knew how to spend he would party at night with all of his friends. He would never work, for he slept all day. He lived for excitement and parties and song. When his money ran out one cold rainy day, he went to his friends, but they turned him away. At last he found work feeding some swine. He said, how I miss that father of mine. My father's servants have plenty to eat while I'm sitting here with no bread and no meat. I'll go to my father. I'll try to be strong. I'll beg for forgiveness. I'll say I was wrong. But while he was still a long ways out, his father saw him, and he ran with a shout. He hugged him and kissed him, his heart filled with joy, and he welcomed back his long-lost boy. The end. And here's the father and the son hugging. Okay? So... Who can tell me what a mistake was in that story, or who made a mistake? I think the, the little boy made the mistake. What mistake did he make? I think he made the mistake by saying, I want my money, and then just staying away from his dad. Yeah, so just saying, I want the money, and then staying away from his dad, making distance between him and his dad. Anybody else? Yeah, not saving any money for when he needs it. Anybody else? Does anybody think the dad made a mistake for just giving the kid all the money and letting him do whatever he wanted? No, Maybe. Maybe? <coughs> so there's two lessons I kind of want to talk about here. One is the lesson between us and our parents, and then the other lesson is with us and God, and those are two slightly different lessons, okay? For us and our parents is this. Who, who thinks that the idea of a party sounds like a good idea? Who likes buying new things? Right? Everybody does. Your parents do too. But they don't always do it because they need to be responsible. So it's important for us to listen to our parents because sometimes they have more information than we have. Okay? And the lesson with God is this. Everybody in this church is the boy who just wanted his money and wanted to go have fun. If you read our prayer of confession again, that's what it was about. It was how we just want to go out, how we don't listen to God, and how we just do what we want to do. When we confess our sins, we come back to God. And what happens when we come back to God? Is he mad at us? Does he keep us out? He forgives us. So God forgives us for when we make mistakes. But... That doesn't mean we should just try to make every mistake we can, right? Would his life have been easier if he listened to God from the beginning? Yeah. So he thought it was a little more boring, but it would have been the right choice. Him trying to do stuff himself 
He thought he was going to have fun, but he had a lot of pain, and then he had to come back anyway, right? So I just want you guys to think about that. He wouldn't have family to sit around in the living room and enjoy, you're right. All right, shall we bow our heads and pray? <coughs> Dear, God, Dear God, thank you for your Bible, for your stories, for loving us, and for forgiving us. <coughs> Help us make good choices and grow closer to you. Amen. All right, you can go to Children's Church or you can go back to with your parents. second time around. Okay? Good luck. <laughs>
reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. And it's on page 195 of your Bible. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord, and do not to men and women, knowing whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. And masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them, for you know that both of <coughs> you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. The word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we've heard your word, and we ask that you open that word for us, that you help us hear the message that is pulled from that word that applies to our lives as we move forward, as we look to honor you, as we look to love you, Lord, as we look to be the best version of ourselves in this new year, Lord. The best way we do that is by letting you into our lives. So we ask for you to step into our lives now. Pray for that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This passage sounds relatively straightforward, but it's kind of a difficult passage. It makes you deal with some different things, and it, it makes you ask some questions that, that are difficult to answer. As I was looking at this passage, um, one of the questions that came up as I was doing some studying is, does Paul condone slavery? He talks about slaves here and how slaves should listen to their masters and doing it with with that joyful kind of heart, and so, so is slavery is, is okay. And then spending many, many years as a youth director, I know that these students would ask me, well, do we always have to listen to our parents? What if our parents tell us to do something that is against what the Bible says? Should we honor our parents or honor God? Hmm? So, so they would give me questions like that as I'd have to see how do I balance uh, taking care of listening to parents while at the same time trying to have people honor their parents. And so this passage brings up some, some questions like that. And, and then there's the other part of this passage. Verse 4 and verse 9 bring up some different questions too because verse 4 is, is directed towards fathers to not provoke their children. And verse 9 is for masters to do the same as, as their servants and to stop threatening them, and, and talks about the, the master that they have there. And so what you have, have here in this passage is, is two couples. It's parents and kids, and then masters and slaves, but it's two relationships that are kind of similar. Here we see where the head is kind of giving instruction, and, and the bottom half, in the, the other side of the couplet, is obey. Um, this is a little different than the passage that we read between husband and lives, where it was talking about submission, Obey here is actually a stronger word than the submission word in, in the ancient language. So we see these two couplets and we tie them together and, and we look at them. So we're going to dive into it a little bit today. We're going to talk a little bit about what Paul is saying and, and how we understand it. But first of all, this is a passage that's awkward because it talks about slavery. I was talking to one of my pastor friends and, uh, and they said, oh, no, I don't preach on those, on those passages because that's, uh, that's a bad word in my church. And so if it is approached, uh, then we don't use the word slavery. We talk about servant or bond servant because people understand that better than they understand the word slave. And I think he kind of has a point that people don't truly understand the word slave in the biblical context. So I wanted to dive into what it meant to be a slave in ancient times. First of all, slavery was different in how we understand it in America because it had nothing to do with race. It had nothing to do with that, nor was it hereditary as, as the history of this country had. Most slaves were prisoners of war, or people would voluntarily put themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. 35% of the population at that time were slaves. It's not necessarily that Paul condoned slavery, it's that slavery was an absolute reality of that time. 
the people that he was preaching to, the people that were coming to church, the people that were, were servants of Jesus Christ and had given their life to him were slaves. Like I said, over a third of the population were slaves. Now, those slaves, their life was a little different than the slaveries that, that we had in America because, first of all, they could earn freedom. They'd either earn or pay off their freedom, and then they would be free people. And a lot of times their masters would then hire them as employees to keep the jobs that they had. Not only that, but slaves were given training, and they were given important jobs with responsibilities. We actually have examples of this in the Bible. When the Israelites went off and were exiled to Babylon, they were made slaves. And there we read about Daniel, who was put in the lion's den, right, for worshiping God. But he was put there because people were mad about how high of a position he had risen to as a slave. So they got training. They got to, to have important jobs. We see the same thing with Joshua. Um, when he went into to slavery, when his brothers sold him into slavery, he was with Potiphar and working for him until Potiphar's wife made some accusations against him. He ended up in jail. Eventually, he interpreted dreams for Pharaoh and ended up being Pharaoh's right-hand man. And then he helped harvest the food and, and take a portion of the food to save it for the first seven years, for the next seven years. So you see, slavery was kind of a completely different thing then than it is now. It was still an extremely difficult way of life. Because the implications were the same that you were a piece of property that was owned. So your masters could do what they wanted with you. So if you had a gracious master that was willing to train you, that was willing to use your gifts and potentially hire you after you were free, that's great. But if that wasn't your master, your life could be very difficult. And so that was the reality that Paul was dealing with at that time. About 10 to 15% of the population were elite and rich. 50% were poor and 35% were, were slaves. That, those are the people he's talking to there. The idea of him talking to kids is actually nothing new to the church. If you look at the Ten Commandments, one of the Ten Commandments, the fourth, maybe the fourth man, somewhere, it's in the Ten Commandments, I promise. But there it talks about for children to obey their, their mothers and their fathers. So you see that in the Ten Commandments, that's nothing new. That's common ground. And in fact, the idea of, of Paul telling slaves to obey their masters was also culturally accurate at that time. Him saying that, it's, you know, it's, like, it's kind of like I said, hey, in Florida, sometimes you guys need to use AC. You'd be like, yep, thanks for the revelation, Pastor. Like, it just, it just is what it is. That was common then. Here's what Paul did that was a little uncommon. We're going to go back to verses uh, 4 and 9 here a little bit. Verse 4, and fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. The father was the head of the household. You did not tell a father how to raise their kids. You did not tell a father how to treat his wife. You did not tell a master how to treat their slaves either. And let's go to verse 9 and see that. And masters, do the same for them. Stop threatening them. For you know that both of you have the same master in heaven. And with him, there is no partiality. Some of you have gone through school and you understand the idea of a caste system, like they have in India, where, where there's different castes of people and those castes aren't really supposed to mix. We have, we have some neighbors in my neighborhood whose marriage was very complicated because they were from two different castes and then they got married and that caused some issues in the family and yada, yada, yada. Luckily, there's been a lot of mending and a lot of healing from that, but that's a cultural reality for people from India. That actually helps us understand the culture in ancient Rome as well. There was the elites that I was telling you about. There was a ton of poor people, and then there were slaves. We've previously read about men and women and how women were also property, how they were essentially a burden if they didn't get married and have children to help propagate the line. So you had these systems. You had these different groups. The slaves were different than the masters. The masters were different from... Their wives. The wives were different from the children. And you had these different segregated groups that each had their responsibility in society. The things that they were allowed to do and the things that they were not allowed to do 
where they could eat, how they could function, the people they could talk to, what was clean and unclean, and all sorts of things. With obviously the cream of the crop being able to do pretty much whatever they want, and at the bottom just being a servant. Now, that might not be new to you and not be interesting to you, but when you realize the context that Paul's writing to, Paul's writing this one letter, and he didn't write one letter to the masters, one letter to fathers, one letter to slaves, and one letter to children. These people had nothing in common. That's not true. They had one thing in common. Their faith their belief that Jesus Christ was their Lord and Savior. In a time when people were completely set apart from each other, they had one thing in common. Paul didn't have to write four to seven different letters. He wrote one letter to all these people. You would be hard-pressed, if not nearly impossible, to find a letter like this from that time. If you go back and read non-biblical historical texts, most of it is directed towards the leaders in society. Even if it's leaders talking to other leaders about how they should lead, how they should do things. Or mandates of the leaders that the leaders put out telling other people how they should act and what they should do. So leaders speaking down to their servants or property that they own in some way or another. Or people talking to each other but you'd never, ever see a letter that spanned all groups of people. Except here, in the Bible. Why do we treat people that are different than us. As less than sometimes. Why do we as churches sometimes fight back and forth saying I have the right answer and you're wrong? Why do we struggle so much with showing God's love? Why is it so easy to see the sins of others and judge others for how far away they are from God. It's difficult being in the church sometimes. It's difficult dealing with other people's struggles and dealing with people struggling with other people. I once had somebody leave the church because we had another person come up to the front and do announcements and they were wearing shorts and you shouldn't wear shorts in church. So they left the church. I hope they found another church and that they're at peace and find that thing. Uh, we installed a screen at my old church back when I was in high school, was it? And when we installed the screen, some people left the church. Now, I can tell you, if I were to put a big TV screen back here right now, I guarantee at least one of you would get up and walk out. I'm not planning on doing that right now. Calm down. <laughs> I don't know how it fits in the aesthetic of this church. The other church was different. Once, there was a credenza purchased that caused people to leave the church. Once... I was not reverent enough during a service, so a family left the church because they felt that I wasn't reverent enough to the position that I'm called to. So people leave the church, and they go find another church that better <coughs> aligns with them. And then what you get is the most segregated hour in America is when churches gather to worship. I'm not going to lie to you, part of the reason that I accepted the call to this church was because this is one of the few Presbyterian churches where that doesn't seem true. We have young, we have old, we have some people who are more well off than others. Like, I, I've said this a million times already, but I love that you can see somebody in a three-piece suit sitting next to somebody in shorts and a t-shirt. We have, you know, like your Hawaiian shirts, we have 
We have vests. We have a little bit of everything here. And I love it. Because that's what the church is called to be. I'm not saying this church has it all right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> we probably have plenty of our own things that we need to fix and work on as well. But I think it's something that we have to think about, that you can go and visit each church, and when you go to those churches, almost everybody sitting in those pews looks exactly the same. And you go from building to building, and then it changes from building to building, but then all those people look the same, and all those people look the same, and all those people look the same. We all answer to one God. We all have one master. And that's what Paul was kind of saying here. This last line that he wrote in verse 9 is the reason he gets beaten and thrown in jail so often. Because he doesn't care about cultural truths. He cares about biblical truth. He cares about Jesus Christ and what God's calling us to. And masters do the same to them. Stop threatening them. For you know that both of you have the same master in heaven. And with him, there is no partiality. No one person is above or below anyone else. We all have sins. We're all broken. We each have difficulties in life. 